I use the best camera I have today, but at least you see my view very well, right? This is the Hudson River. Uh, we had kind of a tor tornado uh, thing, and uh, there wasn't really a tornado this morning, but now we are all fine. And uh, uh, I'm very pleased to be here this morning uh, with Michael, uh, Brad, and uh, Dr. Tunek. I will, exp I will share with you their uh, 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 story in, in, in a second, right before we will start. So good morning. And, and where are you all are this morning? We are in Michigan, all of us. In Michigan. And yeah. how does it look like COVID-wise in, in Michigan? Are you guys uh, on top of things or how does it look like there? No, sure. It's it's it, we're we're in a man we're in a manageable position. Great. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, uh, um, uh, uh, you guys here. Uh, so I'll start maybe with um, uh, Mike uh, Brennan. Uh, just so we know, Mike, if you could, uh, yeah, that's Mike because you're all on the same uh, on the same um, video. Mike is a serial entrepreneur and business leader with thirty. Um, uh, year record of leading and uh, advising startup growth ventures and turnarounds, including four startups he founded and grew nationally. Mike's education and certification includes University of Detroit, uh, 1982, Western Michigan University, Psychology and Business, University of Detroit, Mercy, uh, CAD Design, University of Michigan Entrepreneurial Development, and the Science of Selling, uh, uh, private and 501c3 boards and community work, including Detroit-based startup advisory, public speaking for students, mm -hmm. second entrepreneurs, small businesses, and nonprofit. Um, Brett uh, Homovec, hey, yeah. so the chief financial officer yeah. uh, of Arturez. Um, uh, Brett has spent the last several years serving entrepreneurs and business owners with strategy and implementations of business development plans, corporate finance and capital raising activities and mergers and acquisitions advisory services. Oh, nice. I managed to do the entire sentence without breathing. Um, and uh, Brett gained his corporate finance mergers and acquisition experience as a VP in the investment banking group of Brooklyn and Rancho. Oh, we worked with them. In uh, New York and Chicago, senior associate in the Dean Weider Reynolds Corp Finance Group and as an audit professional for uh, Tosh Ross at Co in New York. Um, and now, uh, Dr. Josefino uh, Tunak, uh, uh, essential figure here. Uh, Dr. Joe Tunak is a medical scientist specializing in the discovery and development of drugs. He studied uh, uh, the biochemistry and, uh, and, 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 and physiology of the human body uh, um, uh, and designed drugs to target uh, dysfunctional mechanisms. He obtained his undergraduate degree from the University of the Philippines, then graduated, uh, uh, graduate studies at South Dakota State, Penn State, and a doctorate degree at Rutgers University in New Jersey. Um, he discovered his first drug at the Awakesman Institute. Uh, this uh, feature prompted Merck to hire Dr. Turnock as a senior scientist and became uh, instrumental in the discovery and development of multi-billion dollar drugs um, including uh, anti-parasitic uh, agent, uh, Avermectin, <clears throat> Avomac, uh, Hogard, and antibacterial antibiotic uh, Prixamine. Um, uh, Avermectin was awarded the 2015 Nobel Prize in Medicine. You really guys are uh, testing my, my pronunciation capabilities, which is fine. And I'm, uh, I, I managed to pull, on, uh, to, to pull through most of it. So, um, uh, maybe we'll start uh, by taking a few minutes to introduce uh, the company to the uh, group before uh, we dive more deeply into uh, the science with Dr. Tunick. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds like a good plan, Danny. Uh, let me um, go ahead and share my screen here and I'll do that for you. Can you see that okay, Danny? Perfect. Okay, wonderful. So listen, uh, everyone, on behalf of Arteries, thank you for the opportunity to present what we believe is a breakthrough scientific discovery that can impact the lives of millions worldwide. For those of you that previously registered for the 27th of July, we appreciate your patience. We also had a tornado come through our town, our area, which is rare. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for that. Uh -huh. Thanks, you. Uh, cardiovascular disease 
is the world's leading chronic killer, impacting more than one third of the world's population. U.S. direct and indirect healthcare costs due to CBD are expected to grow to an estimated 1.5 trillion by 2030. Among the top 150 developing nations worldwide, CBD is the largest health risk and cost, while available therapies are palliative at best. Statins remain the most widely prescribed drug, with more than 400 million prescriptions in the U.S. in 2019 alone. Yet CBD and deaths are on the rise. Mm -hmm. These are staggering numbers. Yet med medical innovation has practically been non-existent in cardiovascular disease for the last 50 years. Real innovation is now a necessity and patients and doctors worldwide demand it. Dr. J.D. Tunick, who you just met, is the president and chairman of Arteries has discovered the multifactorial upstream etiology or root causes of chronic vascular disease, not just cardiovascular disease, but chronic vascular disease broadly, and that those can be characterized, cured, and ultimately prevented. Let me repeat that, characterized, cured, and ultimately prevented. The company's first drug, embotricine, targets healing at the cellular level, rather than targeting symptoms. The company has also developed a biomarker panel for treatment monitoring, which we, which we call glycocardia, that can also be used for disease identification, staging, and classification. As Denny was just telling you, and I'd like to repeat, Dr. Tunick received his PhD from Rutgers Waxman Institute, the World Center for Antibiotic Research. He was the first student at the Watchman Institute to develop a drug known as hydroheptin. He was then hired by Merck as a senior scientist where he led the development of several drugs, including arbamectin, a 2015 Nobel Prize winner, and now used as a multi-purpose drug, including against COVID worldwide. It was also Merck's first billion dollar drug. He then was heavily recruited by Park Davis in their later years, where he continued successful development across the spectrum of disease. In time, his novel ideas inspired him to become an entrepreneur drug owner. Soon after becoming an entrepreneur, Joe opened his first lab and he, where, he, where he almost immediately began the development of mitomycin, an anti-cancer drug licensed and sold to Atsuka which enabled him in 2012 to focus exclusively on vascular research and the development of antithromboembolic compounds for vascular disease aided by biomarkers he also identified. To be clear, we view the antiembolic compounds or this platform at the same level as antibiotics. And we think we can demonstrate that to any of you. I can't emphasize enough how much of a breakthrough we believe this science really is and can be for the world. To understand how best to approach solving vascular disease, Dr. Tunick built a substantial knowledge base um, of where medical science had been in great detail throughout history. He understood that CBD was the leading cause of death worldwide, that cholesterol reduction and palliative symptom treatments have been the prevailing standard of care for more than 50 years. He began with an objective thorough study of vascular disease and the prevailing war on cholesterol that revealed that cholesterol is in fact uh, essential for good health and well being. Again, there is no such thing as bad cholesterol in our view, it is essential for good health and well being. His subsequent research and development led to this breakthrough discovery that we're gonna share with you today that we believe has profound uh, global implications, potentially transforming the standard of care worldwide. Arteries is a Delaware C corporation that wholly owns two Michigan-based LLCs for the concurrent development of diagnostics and therapeutics, which are intertwined and interrelated uh, technology platform. I'd first like to, before I turn this over to Joe Denning, I'd first like to give the audience just a quick context of the endothelial glycocalyx. 
Um, number one, it is the fine slippery lining of the arterial system that enables good blood flow. It houses thousands of molecules, each with its own function and purpose. The endothelial has been very well known, but the endothelial glycocalus until 2017 was widely unknown. It has since been regarded as the holy grail for the study of vascular disease. Number two, plaques in humans are formed underneath this lining, and that is not reflected in the animal models currently used in the study of arthrosclerosis. Three, the majority of cardiovascular diseases occur in the coronary bends, where there is a whirlpool effect. And lastly, number four, uh, when the glycocalyx is damaged, there is an inflammatory and oxidative response, thus triggering a cascade effect. And that, that concludes my just brief introduction, Danny. I'll, I'll come back later. So do you have any questions for Dr. Tunick? Sure, thank you. So Joe, um, in your career, if I understood correctly, uh, you've developed antibiotics, cancer drugs, and even a Nobel Prize winning drug that has multiple uses, including against COVID, right? So that's uh, very interesting. Uh, where does this discovery stand by uh, comparison? And what is the basis uh, of your discovery? It's, um, okay, it's, first of all, let me say hello to everybody, folks. Um, I wish I could see all of you, but uh, this will do for now, uh, giving you an overview of uh, what we're trying to do. You asked me a question, how does the discovery that I had had compare to what I'm gonna be, be presenting you? Mm -hmm. When I, was, when I was starting my career, the biggest thing about health at that point was infectious disease. And so I came up with an idea of looking at infection as a separate entity. And it was easy for me to target infectious disease because the cause of infectious disease are bacteria. All you have to do is target what's unique in a bacteria that's not found in the humans. And that's come, how I come up with a lot of those antibiotics. Now, if you look at the bacteria, there is a defense mechanism in the bacteria that you could target uniquely. And if you look at the human being, I was looking at the same platform and I found out that in the human being, the cells in the human being are also co composed of what you call a defensive mechanism called the glycocalyx. There's a seal in every human cell. And if you penetrate that human cell, you disrupt the seal of the human cell, you're gonna have the disease. So let me go ahead and give you a background, an overview. This is just an overview, folks. The first thing that I'm gonna be talking to you about would be to describe to you who we are. And as we go through the journey of living, what caused the diseases? And then after that, I'm gonna give you an overview of the drugs and diagnostics that we have. So let me start with the, we are 40 trillion cells, you know that, which need daily nourishment. An average human being, I look at it an average human being as, four, as 70 kilograms or 155 pounds. And we are, with, with that average human being, we have 40 trillion cells. Oh, yeah. oh. oh. Mm -hmm. that one's so okay. okay, so here we are. We are a human being. We are made of 40 trillion cells. And what are the cells made of? We, the, the cells are made of the nucleus. Nucleus contains DNA, the, the blueprint of life. And then also in the cell, we have the liquid part, which is the cytoplasm, the liquid. I'm, I'm just trying to uh, explain to you a little bit of the technical uh, background of what I do and who we are. Uh, some people might understand a lot, but some people might get bored, but let me go through the whole thing and, and put it in perspective, okay? So we have the mitochondria. 
The mitochondria is the powerhouse of us, our body. We have about 30 to 30,000 mitochondria per cell. This gives us the energy, folks. And we have the membrane. This is what I was telling you before. The bacteria would have a defense mechanism by being a cell wall. Us human beings we are made of membranes. And the membrane is made of 40 to 80% cholesterol. The membrane differentiates us from, from the plants. We are animals and we have the plants. The plants are made of cell wall. We are made of membrane. And, and us are made of 9% solid cells and about 91% of liquid cells. And the liquid cells are, 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 are red blood cells, platelets, lymphocytes. We are made of about 64% of red blood cells. And the building block of our cell is cholesterol. The cholesterol maintains the membrane integrity. Our brain, think about it, our brain is 70% cholesterol. Our bile is cholesterol that helps in the digestion and recycling the red blood cells. We have the vitamin D for immunity. Vitamin D is a cholesterol. The hormones are cholesterol. The hormones deliver the messages and activate other organs. Cortisol is cholesterol. Think about it. If you are under stress, you need cortisol to be able to get over the stress and you need cortisol to fight stress. Cholesterol is needed for cell growth and repair. And now what, what we have gone through the past decades is that cholesterol is bad for you. I don't believe that cholesterol is bad for you. Cholesterol is good for you. And now what we have been doing is trying to reduce cholesterol to reduce heart disease. To me, that's a misguided hypothesis. The cells die and replace. Think about it. If the cells die and replace, you need cholesterol to replace them. You are not the same person from yesterday. Every cell is replaced except the neurons, and the neurons are the brain and your eyes. That's the only thing that keeps you tied up with, with, with yesterday. And look at this thing here. The intestinal lining changes every five days. The white blood cells every five days. The lung alveolar every eight days. The platelets 10 days. The skin. Your skin is shed. Not all at once, but it changes every 15 days. The red blood cells die 120 days. You, you can see that thing, liver cells, 250 days. The heart even may change in 20 years. So what keeps us alive? What keeps us alive is the food that we eat. But what does the food that we eat comes, what do we get from the food we eat? We extract electrons, electrons, electricity. Electrons provide wattage, electricity, said, and bond atoms to produce molecules. The electrons are the ones that are keeping the cells together. They bond together. And so when we eat, the food that we oxidize would release electrons from hydrogen. Let me explain this to you. So oxygen moves electrons and we, we call oxygen the breath of life. Think about it. Electron, I mean, oxygen is the breath of life, but, ele but oxygen also is the one that does it at end. We are being corroded of basically up to the age 40. Then we are trying going downhill. Okay, here is the mitochondria. So I told you before, the most active cells the lymphocytes, I mean, the, the mitochondria, the level of mitochondria in, in, in the cells are different. 
the non-active cells like the lymphocytes, you have maybe about 300 lymphocytes. I mean, 300 mitochondria. The more active cells you have, the, uh, the liver, the kidney, the heart, the brain, and the parietal cells, you have about 2,000, 3,000 mitochondria. Think about a car that is, rep that, is, that, is that, that, that has a lot of pistons keep working, but in, in time, you're gonna go ahead and, uh, and corrode the, the piston. See, what happens here is if you eat, I don't know what you eat, but these are the food that are available. And um, if you eat, the, if, if you break down the food by digestion, metabolism, and basically because the food that we eat is made of carbon and hydrogen, hydrocarbon for, 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 the, for the gasoline and carbohydrates for the food that we eat, they are the same and the same mechanism to produce energy. So we isolate, as you, as, as you um, digest the food, we separate the carbon and the hydrogen. And the hydrogen is stored in what we call a storage tank called NADH, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, AKA vitamin B3 or niacin. It traps the hydrogen. And when it traps that, then the hydrogen goes through the uh, electron transport system. There we go. The, uh, the, 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 there's a membrane that separates the hydrogen, proton, and the electron. So we got the electrons extracted from the, from the hydrogen, but the, hyd the electron doesn't move. And if it doesn't move, we don't have any life. So what we do is we breathe oxygen and as we breathe oxygen, oxygen is what we call the, the uh, atom, the only atom in the world that's electronegative. And being electronegative is always trying to steal electrons from any place. So now what it does, it, it, it steals electrons and the electrons move. And when the electrons move, it produces energy called ATP. And the ATP, as you might see, one ATP, and, and you know what calories are, is seven calories, 29 joules energy. And so the rest of the thing becomes the, the um, waste hydrogen bonds back with oxygen and becomes water. And the, the uh, waste carbon dioxide, carbon becomes carbon dioxide and goes back to the lung. But look at these things, folks. The electrons, the electron transport system, the tube, the tube that moves the that contains the electrons is not tight. There is a leak in there. And so the electrons leak out. But 4% of the leak, of, about 4% of the electrons leak out. And what's going to happen here? It leaks out. It reacts back with oxygen and creates a more negative type of oxygen. And there are a few bunch of them here. You got your hydrogen peroxide, you got hypochlorous, you got hydroxyl ions, you got um, singlet oxygen, and the whole bunch of these things that is contained in your body. They're contained in your body and they are oxidative. But not all of them are oxidative. You got an optimum level. If you have an optimum level, they are good because they help you. They help benefit level of ROS. It helps in the cell signaling, cellular differentiation, tissue and growth. But the problem is you overeat. You, 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 you come up with excess ROS, which is harmful. This is oxidative. It causes life diseases and aging. So that's the basic background of who we are. Now, we talk about ROS. ROS, excess ROS is the one that causes life. Normal eating, we come up with a beneficial level of ROS. And these are the ROS that are produced. 
and this is the uh, the 1.35 times 10 to the 4 ROS per day. That's how much we produce by eating normal normally. But what happens is we produce ROS, but there's homeostasis. You got antioxidants that are built in and produced in our body. And these are the antioxidants. You have the SOD, the catalase, the glutathione, the uh, peroxidase, you could see that. And the processing speed is like having an automatic sprinkling system in your house. If you have a lot of fire, it will automatically come, uh, turn on and get rid of the fire. And that's what's happening in our system. But when you overload the system, how do we overload the system? It's because of the environment. The environment and lifestyle is the cause of disease, folks. It's not the genes. The genes don't have anything to do with creating disease. Mark that thing down. And so what happens when you have a lot of exposure and distress and lifestyle, you are overwhelming the defense mechanism of your body and you got oxidation and inflammation. And look what happens here. ROS beyond this level, you got, I call it xenoplexic disease, and Mike was talking about chronic disease. They are almost, the, they are the same, but I came up with a, a term called xenoplexic disease, and I could explain it to you later on. So the xenoplexic diseases are the cardiovascular, neuro, you could see that the inflammatory cancer, the whole, whole works here. And the aging, to me, is also a natural disease, senescence, organ discomfort, and frailty. Look what ha happens here. People that want to live longer, what do they try to do? They're trying to minimize the level of reactive oxygen species. And look what they, we've been doing. We, we come up with calorie restriction diet. Our diet normally is about 2,500 calories per day, but a lot of people would go down as far as 1,000 calories per day just to limit the level of ROS. The starvation diet, the same thing. Vegetarians come up with an idea of by eating a lot of vegetables, you reduce the level of, uh, of ROS. Meditation, think about the nuns. The nuns meditate a lot and they have the longer lifespan of the humans. Okay, so the Russians were ahead of us, folks. They came up with the idea of how do we prolong or how do we how do prevent aging? So one of the ideas that they came up with is they thought that protein, eating too much protein, would be a, a problem because the proteins would be containing a lot of those ROS. So they so one guy named Ignatowski fed milk, milk, meat, and egg to a rabbit and found foam cells in the aorta, okay? And then his student, his student repeated what he did and Anistika repeated the, and fed yolk only and observed catastrophic in the energy and atherosclerosis. And voila, they said, look, eating too much meat is going to create a problem. And this is where the cholesterol hypothesis come from. They said that cholesterol would create some brittle blood vessels. And this is where the cholesterol hypothesis comes from. The problem with the hypothesis is animal processes meat differently. Think about that. The herbivore, the rabbit, the rabbit is the one that they use as a model. The rabbit cannot process meat, fat and cholesterol. That's why they accumulate in the artery and produce fatty streak. But look at carnivore. You feed all, you, you, you feed all kinds of meat to carnivore. They don't have any cardiovascular disease. They don't have any fatty streak. On the other hand, if you feed a carnivore with Carbohydrates, they don't know how to process carbohydrates. That's why they have to become obese. Us human beings, we are omnivores. 
we can process and not accumulate diet cholesterol. Think about that. So in the 1920s, we have the industrial revolution. There was an increase in the incidence of CVD. So the American Heart Association was born. The American Heart Association was founded by six, six physicians. And they decided to come up with a society to address the problem of cardiovascular disease. And the American Heart Association raised money and tried to fund research regarding the cure or, or, or treatment of cardiovascular disease. And then with the funding, they came up, they, they invoked the result of the recent Russian experiment that, and, and that cholesterol is a problem. And it, in time, the war on cholesterol evolved. So there was in, um, so in 1961, think about this thing. In 1961, the a a -H -A, the American Association, actually specifically target eggs as bad for you because eggs has a lot of cholesterol. So they wanted to limit the amount of eggs that you eat, three eggs per week, that's the limit. And there's another enterprising fellow in, in, in Japan who jumped the gun and decided, hey, I'm going to be just like this guy, Alexander Fleming, or my, uh, my mentor at Rutgers, um, Waxman. I'm going to go ahead and screen microorganisms and find out if there is an, a, uh, an, a, an extract from microorganism that would lower cholesterol. And so he used a model. He used an enzyme called HMG-CoA reductase inhibitor, and he came up with a drug. The first statin called compactin. But when he tried the compactin outside of the rabbit model, it failed to lower cholesterol. So they dropped it. It didn't work. At that time, Merck was also dumping the gun and trying to come up with a, uh, a cholesterol. They, so they came up with a cousin cholesterol, cholesterol statin called uh, lovastatin. But at the same time in 1977, the American Heart Association was getting a little bit more active. So they forced a hearing in the government and they have, they, they have a, a hearing and they were able to lobby that we have to control our diet and the diet is gonna be with, no, with low cholesterol. And they said low cholesterol with no clinical evidence. So, so Merck discovered statin, low statin. And in fact, the statin, the second statin that Merck that they developed, it was not active either. So they dropped it. But look what, who, who happened to come along. You have Bolton and Brown who had been working and looking at the cause of, high, of genetic hypercholesterolemia. This was funded by AAA, uh, American Heart Association and funded by NIH. So they begged Merck for them to try their drug against high selected patients with, with, with hypercholesterol, uh, high cholesterol. And look what happened. The, the, the drug was active and it was then approved and, 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 and the government was ecstatic about this thing because now they have the first clinical evidence that we could, we could lower cholesterol. And so the FDA approved, uh, approved lovastatin for FH. And so voila, in 1987, war on cholesterol is justified. Lovastatin became the default drug prescribed to the public. And look what happened here, the NIA, we don't know, they didn't have any idea what is the right level of, of cholesterol? But the NIH came out and they decided to come up with a, a, um, a panel 
And this is the panel they come at total cholesterol, BLDL, LDIDL, LDL, HDL, plus 20% triglyceride. There's no rhyme or reason for that one. And then everybody came up with their own brand of statin. You got lovastatin, you have that. You got travastatin, simvastatin, lovastatin, and a whole bunch. It, a Bayer came up with a, silver, a super statin. You got 0.2 milligrams of super statin, and it kills people. That's why it came off the market. In 204 statin clinical trial, they finally came up with a clinical trial of all the statin. And you could see that thing, Mevacor, they got a AFCA PCS and Pravastatin. Just are the, uh, just are the uh, clinical trials that they came up with, Atorvastin, And what happens is they are not effective. The statins are ineffective and the uh, global CBD death keeps going. And uh, actually the FDA came up with a warning and said that the statin is, uh, is, is, is deleterious to, 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 um, to health, but the NIA and IS defied the warning and instead they came up with a better, uh, with, with the more aggressive use of statin. Uh, and in fact, the head of the, uh, the AAAs came up with uh, a, 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 a declaration that no target for ideal LDL cholesterol level, but guideline recognizes it recognizes in principle that lower is better. Are we going to put here? Okay. So to me, the environmental stress triggers CBD. It's not cholesterol, and we are exposed to a lot of an, of, um, of environmental stress. You got your you got this, you got the sun, you got the radioactive materials, you got particulate matters in the air. And uh, you could see that thing over there with a lot of uh, metal. And as you, uh, as you are exposed, you, even the uh, lymphocytes, they disrupt the seal of the cell called glycocalyx. And all this ROS would get through. And what would they do? They oxidize. They create inflammation and they become antigenic and create some problems. The glycocalyx is a physical uh, barrier. I told you before, this, this is the glycocalyx and the glycocalyx contains a lot of ornamentations. And uh, these are the ornamentations that you see, the whole bunch of them. What's very unique about the glycocalyx is the glycocalyx is the only place where you have a negative charge. Think about it. The glycocalyx is the only place that you have a glyco that, that you have negative charge in the body. So the glycocalyx then becomes a haven, becomes a nest of positive proteins. And what are the positive proteins here? Nest of thousands of positive molecules enzymes, but what are they? You got your anticoagulant, you got your uh, subparic, I told you before we have antioxidant, SOD is number one of them, and you got the, the fat thinner, they are all nested in the glycocalyx. So now if you disrupt the glycocalyx, all those things that are nested in there are disrupted. Okay, I'm supposed to pause here. Any questions so far, Daddy? Thank you. Are you still there? Uh, we have a question here, but uh, maybe I'll go with just a couple more questions before we'll uh, uh, answer that question that I see coming here. Um, so uh, if glycocalyx uh, disruption is uh, the upstream cause of cell uh, uh, dis uh, dysfunction uh, that manifests downstream as symptoms we think of as diseases, how does that impact therapeutic and diagnostic development for cardiovascular disease? Okay, good question, good question. So let me explain to you here. This is, this is the, um, the glycocalyx is the uh, upstream cause of the disease because if you disrupt the glycocalyx, then it would trickle down and develop symptoms. And the symptoms that you see will be the ones that everybody is targeting. So here is 
And so we all the drugs that we have in the market right now are symptom targeted drugs. They don't cure. They're just trying to, they are band-aid trying to mask the symptom. So what this is what I've done here. For CBD, the problem with CBD is the clot. The clot is the fatal cause of the, of, of, um, of the CBD. It kills, the clot is the one that kills. And how, so what I did is I looked at the clot as the target, okay, for the drug. Quest for anti-embolic, the, 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 the clot is the same as embolic, embolism. So you come up with a, I came up with the idea of the quest for anti-embolic drug, okay? So I decided to come up with a, um, with a, uh, uh, I tried to summarize where this that clot comes from. And here's what I came up with. So you got the blood vessel, you got the blood vessel, if you have, if you have trauma in the blood vessel, surgical puncture, laceration and drug, you create a clot, a clot, because it disrupt this and it's like pricking your skin. If you prick your skin, you got blood comes out and that's the clot as well that is represented inside your body. So the other, and the other side, you got, you got the bifurcation and then think about your system here. Think about the, the, um, the um, blood vessel in your system, it's like a highway. If you have a, if you have a straight highway, the car's moving fast, no problem. But if you have bifurcation, you got the slowdown of the car. You got slowing down of the red blood cells and they create a full flow, full flow effect. Acidic blood, this is just a side issue here. If you, the roller effect, if you have acidic blood, think about it, if you drink, Carbonated drinks, you have a you have a temporary clot that builds up. And that if you have some underlying condition, that could contribute also the, the clot formation here. You got high fat diet. Uh, it, think about again, <laughs> let me give you an analogy here. If you have if you have a a car you go into the highway and you go into the bend, the car slows down. Now if you have a big CMI. In, 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 in that curve, it actually slows down a little bit better. So the big CMI crop would be equivalent to the VLDL. I could explain to you, but let's get going here. So the VLDL creates high blood viscosity and it slows down the flow. And it slows down the flow. You got, you got uh, the chemical pollutants. They all destroy the glycocalyx. And when you destroy the glycocalyx, you got clot formation. So what I can come up with is I have to come up with some compounds. I, I decide, identify some targets. And target one, we got target two. Target one is to uh, target the uh, high viscosity and the pollute. And then the target two would target the, um, the um, pollutants. Target three, target reactive oxygen species. Target four is chronic inflammation, and target five targets actually directly the clot formation. So, what did I come up with this target? I came up with, I, I decided to, to, um, to synthesize compounds. And for target one, these are the compounds that I synthesize. We have actually uh, eight, nine of them. But for now, we have, we have uh, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We have we have eight here, but we have actually nine. So think about it. Cardiovascular disease is a complex disease. It's not just like a one target disease, like microorganism. The building up of the oxidants and inflammation and the disruption of the glycocalyx are my target. So we have to go ahead and combine all the compounds there and and I came up with a combination, three, triple combination, and you could see A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and A, L, L, okay? And so I developed a mouse model. I created a high fat diet. I, I fed the mouse with high fat diet. Think about it, folks. A mouse is very resistant to cardiovascular disease. They never, seldom, they never or seldom get any cardiovascular disease. 
But if you are going to go ahead and mimic the lifestyle of what we have in, 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 um, in mouse, you could actually create and develop plants in mouse. And so I, I created a high fat diet to make the blood viscous, I told you before. And then I, I treated the mouse with a, with a pollutant. The most common pollutant is the PCB, oxidative. So I created a mouse and lo and behold, I found out that Kambuke was curative and preventive of plaques, which is confirmed by histopathology. So right off the bat, we have a, if you look at this thing, no plant. And so right off the bat, we know that we have something here. And the other thing that is interesting about this is we, we um, followed the development of plaques by histopathology, but we also followed the development of the plaque by the pattern of disruption of the glycocalyx. And these are the markers that we have. Syndicon, hyaluronan, heparin, plasmidinin, activated. Okay, so we have a four panel biomarker. Think about it. The biomarkers that everybody's using is a one single biomarker. It doesn't work. You need to have a pattern. You have to have a jury to be able to be objectively able to detect or diagnose a disease. Go on. A, a, a this, so we have a breakthrough discovery here. Do you have any question there uh, so far, Danny? Um, I have a question from uh, Mike, but uh, just before that, I want to just mention because we're 50 minutes into the conversation that uh, I want to mention to everybody that we will be talking soon about your raise here uh, and the valuation of the company and the company is raising 2.5 million or the $25 million cap. We'll talk about it soon, so stay tuned for that. Uh, I'll just say that somebody's asking here if they will be able to receive a copy of your presentation. So I don't know if you guys do that, but uh, I'm sure you can contact Mike later on to ask for that, right? Um, so I'll let you answer that, Mike, in a second. Mike, you mentioned um, 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 that you discovered or identified a set of uh, biomarkers. I'm back to my questions in the development process. Can you discuss that part of the platform a bit more and any other concluding thoughts uh, you may have about uh, the science? Um, yeah, so the, 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 the biomarkers, Joe, Joe added you know, three or four more slides, but we got a, we got a okay. little long in our, in our explanations and we're, we're gonna skip over that for today. But let me, let me just say that we are in very good position with our biomarkers. We have seven uh, biomarkers in our panel. Four of the seven are patented. Uh, we have successfully paired our, our, our markers and have the body kit for the expansion of our studies. And um, so within a 12 to 18 month period, we expect to be entering a licensing arrangement. So we see, we see the standalone uh, glycocardia kit, diagnostic kit, uh, being a revenue generating source for the company even prior to human trials for our therapy. So Denny, let me, let me just continue here and conclude. You asked about the concluding thoughts and our, our raise. Our clinical strategy is to conduct three concurrent phase 1B studies, one within the IND framework and two proof of concept studies out of country concurrently, perhaps in Australia, as an example, where we have a solid clinical infrastructure already in place uh, to support us and where cost savings uh, can approach 50% that of U.S. cost. We're working with highly regarded uh, providers currently, including Camargo Research, CRO Selection and Oversight, uh, Ray Biotech, as I mentioned, for the continued development of our diagnostic kit, which again, is both a standalone diagnostic as well as a companion diagnostic for our drug or for other drugs, uh, it can be used as a, as a companion diagnostic currently on the market or forthcoming. In addition to Nuventra, who we recently engaged for FDA regulatory guidance 
uh, which includes our FDA pre-IND, which begins next week, uh, just to name a few. Some other notes to consider, uh, we had previously conducted mouse toxicity study, which resulted in a therapeutic window of 333 times to one, that's extraordinary. In addition, we've recently completed a rat in vivo study, which again demonstrated no toxicity, even at 800 milligrams per kilogram, translating to a therapeutic window of 1500 times to one. And we'll soon complete a transla trans translational, uh, uh, that, that is animal to human, ejection fraction study, the first of its kind, with Henry Ford Hospital System in Detroit, uh, which will be co-published representing our third peer-reviewed publication this year. And finally, we expect to exit our first clinical indication within 24 to 36 months, uh, providing liquidity for investors and exponential growth opportunities for the company. We are a platform technology company. CBD and the, and the first indications of CBD are just the beginning for what we can do. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have, we have now issued patents for all nine compounds, 90% uh, of our applied methodologies and four of seven biomarkers, which are very difficult to obtain in the US. Um, our patent attorney is building what we refer to as a patent monopoly based on this issued IP with new pending IP and PCP patents, et cetera, to make sure that our protection, that our, that our position is well protected uh, this is based on the, the, the hypothetical that we're building a multi-billion dollar uh, portfolio. We believe that we are. We've also re recently received two independent valuation analyses of our therapy versus just three targeted indications and our IP portfolio overall. $105 million uh, for the therapy versus three indications, 471 million for the overall portfolio. Uh, you know, while we're thrilled to have these early valuation metrics, we understand the challenges ahead to accomplish our clinical objectives. We also have several uh, trademarks that, that I think you asked about earlier. So once that occurs, once that first exit occurs, whether it be the diagnostic or uh, after first uh, IND studies, uh, first clinical studies, phase 1B clinical studies, once that occurs, we will have the opportunity to develop solutions for other diseases, including diabetes, type 2, arthritis, et cetera. Dr. Paul, Paul Woolley, as an example, whom developed Embryo, regards our science as revolutionary and has said he would come out of retirement only to work with Dr. Tunick on a novel arthritis therapy. So uh, to your question about the raise, Denny, and I know we're running short on time, we're currently raising up to $2.5 million in a bridge to our Series A which is a concurrent raise. So it's a total of 10 million that we're raising, two and a half and then seven and a half. Or if someone is interested in, in funding the full 10 million, then we would close the two and a half million dollar bridge round if the terms are acceptable to us uh, in lieu of the larger, of larger offering. So but currently we're, we, we have a two and a half million dollar convertible debenture available. We're raising money on that raise currently. We've got commitments of about $750,000 already. We just opened that on August 1st. We've established what we believe are very attractive terms for that raise, and we'll be happy to discuss that with any of you. Uh, we can also provide detailed analysis and data that suggest ROI of a minimum of 12X for this round to perhaps as high as 80 times. And we have uh, sound rationale to support those numbers. Lastly, we anticipate a significant jump in valuation at each of three upcoming inflection points, including the end of October, uh, which, would, which would represent what we believe will be our pre-IND submission and feedback from the FDA. Once that occurs, we think we will have de-risked the company substantially. Thank you, Denny, for your, for your, for your time. And I, I, we, I wish we would have made more time for Q&A. Oh. We, we, can, yeah. we can we can keep on going. Uh, okay. You know, uh, first of all, there's a question here. Is your yeah. drug for people who haven't developed a coronary disease or would your drug help people who have already had uh, a coronary disease or wow. even bypass surgery? Yeah, that's a really excellent question. 
uh, the, the first way to answer that question is we can only focus on what we can prove. And what we can prove is curative. We've already demonstrated and proved curative in animals. But we intend to prove curative in humans against three indications. We can't prove preventive, but it is a it is a foregone conclusion that embotricine will be used as a preventative as a preventative therapy and lower dosages at earlier age groups. We believe that embotricine and similar drugs that we can develop have the potential to replace statin drugs in the market as the next paradigm. In addition, we believe that glycocardia can become the next evolution or revolution, as it were, uh, uh, to, to supplant the lipid panel. When you look at the usefulness and utility of the lipid panel and statin drugs and what they do, what they really do, versus what embotricine does, enabling the body to heal itself, and glycocardia, a true measure of plaque shed detritus in the body, we think we can defend that position, and we're we're very excited about it, and we think the audience should be as well. And um, uh, somebody's asking if they can receive a copy of the presentation. I guess they can contact you for that, right? Yes, please. Uh, it's Mike at artereze.com, Mike at arteries.com. Uh, you're welcome to contact me. I'm happy to have a direct conversation with any of you. If you'd like to see a deeper presentation from Dr. Tunick or talk to Brett Homovac, he's got to squeeze his face in here a little bit more. Uh, Brett, the CFO, can share ROI analysis, the patents. Uh, Denny, we also have a drop-off that's very well populated with all of our studies and data and information, due diligence. We've got five law firms that we hired specifically for their, for their expertise in various areas that we think, we, we, while we are preclinical, and there are always risks with uh, uh, biotechnology companies. We are well advanced, working with a one of a kind genius scientist, uh, developing a science that we believe represents the next paradigm uh, in, in the evolution uh, to solve vascular disease once and for all. Thank you. And Joe, if I can ask you, how many diseases do you think this platform, uh, uh, a platform like this, could address? Uh, he's asking. He's asking. Other than CBD, how many other diseases do you think you could address? Oh. With this <laughs> Excellent question. I hate to tell you this, but I told you before the glycocalyx is the external seal of the cell, and from then on, you have the, what they call it, the downstream effect of the disruption of the glycocalyx. And this is what you have. You didn't see the whole picture here, but you have the cancer, you got diabetes, you got Alzheimer's. All those diseases to me could be cured, but we cannot address all of them at once. Then we need to focus first on the cardiovascular disease. But the, the potential of a platform of, of combination therapy. And we have all those compounds that we could combine together. We could cure or prevent all kinds of chronic disease. Um, Mike, uh, do you have an audited financial statement? Uh, Michael is asking. Yes, we have a... Um... An external firm, they're not truly audited. We have an external firm, a firm, Crosby Lanny, that um, that that uh, monitors our uh, financials on a monthly basis to provide third-party analysis of our financials and financial statements. Um, Joe, with a diagnostic platform, are you suggesting diseases might be predicted or diagnosed before symptoms become serious? I mean, can they be used as a, as a diagnostic even <laughs> before disease becomes serious? Oh, that's another excellent question. Have you heard of the DNA fingerprint? Yes. The DNA fingerprint is the only accurate way of diagnosing who the perpetrator is. 
we are developing a disease fingerprint and we have proven it that we could actually diagnose different kinds of chronic disease, different kinds of cardiovascular disease, hypertension, cardio, uh, chronic, I mean, uh, CHD and stroke. And we have also put in diabetes and Alzheimer's and the computer actually differentiate all those things. So the, the next generation that I'm trying to tell you is a scary because we could come up with an equivalent of a DNA fingerprint for disease. So the answer to the question, Jenny, is we already have demonstrated this through statistical analysis and, and can, can share that data in pilot studies. Now, Mike, you mentioned that the therapy is made out of three uh, simple compounds. Yeah. There been analysis done to confirm that they can actually be scaled up easily into humans? Yes, we're working with the firm Cambridge. Uh, a DSK out of North Carolina developed our early compounds and did various salt profiles to optimize those compounds. We then moved the compounds to Cambridge, which is one of the largest, most respected manufacturers in the country and uh, in the United States. I don't know if they're international, but certainly in the United States, also based in North Carolina. And uh, they did an analysis. They see no issues in terms of the scale up uh, from GLP to GMP for our compounds. Simple, pure compounds. Tempo I also mentioned your net present day valuations of your patent portfolio. Were those I'm, I'm, I'm saying, sorry, Dean. Yeah, you. You mentioned your net present day valuations of your patent portfolio, right? Yeah. Uh, were those done by a firm with specific expertise in biopharma? Yes, they were. Yes, they were. The group uh, Sagacious out of uh, India, uh, they, they, uh, they have a group that's specifically focused on biopharmaceutical. We're happy to share that, those reports. These are, these are very detailed analyses that use independent data and, and uh, hundreds of, of existing entities, companies, and their drugs and methodologies and current valuations as a means to determine the net present day of our, of our, of our, net, of our uh, uh, IP. I will say that those, that IP, as an example, we have a $471 million net present. We think this is a, a, a billion dollar plus, maybe two to $3 billion plus exit, depending on the data that comes out of uh, human efficacy trials. Um, having said that, and today we recognize where we are in process, we factored that in to our raise. That's why our current raise for the two and a half million, we think is extraordinary and attractive at a $25 million um, yeah, yeah. value cap on the uh, series A. So the first three, it converts upon the first three million that comes in in the series A. We're already being vetted uh, by a couple of firms for that series A. And so I would, I would encourage anyone listening to, you know, try to get in touch with us sooner than later. And let's, uh, let's talk through that and we'll, and we'll share everything we have. Just a couple of more questions. Does the, the, does the 10 million uh, get you, uh, that you're raising, will get you all the way through your pre- clinical work and diagnostic development to enter human trials? Yeah, that's an excellent question. 10 million is the, is the most we will need. We may need, not need that much. Um, there, there is some wiggle room in that number. We know it's going to be somewhere between 8 and 10 million. It really boils down to the FDA. If the FDA wants to see a little bit more data, if it takes us a little longer, a little bit more work to get to our FDA uh, IND, uh, we've got that kind of $2 million in there. If we don't need the 10 million, then that 2 million will be applied to our clinical and enable us to, to, to begin patient recruitment, as an example, sooner than later. And we, we, we have a history of, of, of trying to uh, stay on schedule or ahead of schedule and to anticipate what's going to come. For the next 18 months, everything for us is blocking and tackling. We know exactly what to do and how to do it effectively. And one last question. Have you considered who you might work with for CRO oversight for your clinical in the US 
or abroad? Indeed, we, we've had discussions with um, a, a number of groups, including MedPace and others. I don't, I don't wanna talk too much by name, but the major players in the market, the major players in the market are the, are the folks that we, that we are talking to currently for our, um, for our clinical, for our clinical work. And that includes Australia and in other countries. So um, yeah, Mike, Brett, and Joe, thank you uh, so much for the time. Now, anything else you'd like to add at this stage? Um, just that we're, we are extremely excited. We're honored to have the opportunity to work with Dr. Tunick. Brett and I have been involved with him for several years. We began the company in 2018, but Joe has been working exclusively on this antibiotic platform since 2012. So we are not a new entity. This is not new science. It is pioneering science. It is evolutionary science. It's a revolutionary science. And we welcome the opportunity to, to, to share our data and our, uh, and our, 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 our um, uh, strategy and to be challenged uh, by, by folks in the audience. I know you've got some very bright people uh, involved. And we're, we're very hopeful to engage them in discussion. We're also good men. We're good people. And we, we, we're, we're well-meaning. We're science first. And we're business second. I'm not, I'm not dismissing the importance of, uh, of the business, but we take a science first mentality. And we think that's very important for this paradigm. Thank you for, uh, so much for that. Uh, we will send all the information uh, tomorrow to our uh, attendees, your contact information. Uh, uh, all of those who couldn't attend today would receive uh, a link, including those who have for the recorded session. And I'll tell everybody that next Thursday, uh, I'll be speaking, uh, our next session is really uh, with one of the biggest families in India, okay? The uh, Munjal family, which are the owners of the largest two-wheeler uh, manufacturer in the world, Aero Moto Corp. So uh, we'll, we'll be talking with them. I believe their company is worth today around $8.5 billion. Um, and I'll speak to their CIO, um, uh, Nitai uh, um, uh, Utkarsh, Next Thursday, we'll be talking about everything from investments, capital markets, to how they invest, everything, COVID in India and, and what we're looking to see in the world uh, in, in many aspects. So, so it's gonna be a very exciting next Thursday. So thank you everybody. And we hope uh, to see all of you uh, uh, um, uh, in person, um, uh, Mike, Dr. Tunek and, and Brett, um, um, yeah, so thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you, Danny. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thanks for all the time. Thank you, thank you everybody. Stay okay. safe. Bye-bye.